Welcome to the Untold Black History Collab, everybody. Long ago, one of my fellow collaborators, Jabari of the From Nothing channel, taught me about a traditional C-section surgery performed in Africa. More recently, I've learned of some other forms of surgeries from Africa's past, and that's what I want to share with you today. The particular culture that we'll be discussing is the Kisi people of Kenya and their traditional doctors known as Omobaris. Now, the main thing an Omobari, aka Ababari, is known for is conducting a form of brain surgery. Yes, you heard me right. Before the dawn of modern medicine, some folks were already doing brain surgery. And it wasn't just people in Kenya either. But before we get into all that, I want to talk about some other notable surgeries that Omobaris perform. Back in the 1980s, Dr. David W. Furness and his team studied the work of the Omobaris, and some of the other medical procedures these traditional Kisi doctors performed included back, chest, and leg surgery. Not a whole lot of details were in the paper about those first two, but there was a good amount of info on the leg surgeries, so let's dig into that real quick. These leg operations are known in the medical field as sequest rectomies and are carried out to treat a condition known as osteomyelitis. Chronic osteomyelitis is a common issue in Kisi villages. I wish this paper said why it's common among the Kisi, but unfortunately it doesn't bother explaining. So what is osteomyelitis anyway? According to mayoclinic.org, osteomyelitis is a bone infection and it can affect one or more parts of a bone. Infections can reach a bone through the bloodstream or from nearby infected tissue. Infections can also begin in the bone if any injury opens the bone to germs. Now as the research paper was saying, to deal with osteomyelitis, the omobari would perform a sequestrectomy. This operation involves the removal of of the parts of the bone that has become infected. So yeah, that's a pretty impressive bit of traditional medical knowledge right there. Now let's move on to the operation the Omobari are most known for, brain surgery. As I hinted at earlier, brain surgery wasn't just practiced in Kenya. In fact, the practice could be found in other parts of Africa as well. And beyond that, brain surgery was also practiced by certain cultures on other continents too. Given that it's a global practice, some of you may be wondering what makes this Kenyan brain surgery so special. Is it really worth talking about? Well, to answer that, let's say I did a video about Kenyan architecture. You understand it's different than architecture in Japan, right? Furthermore, at the end of this video, we'll compare the results of this old school African brain surgery to the kind of brain surgery that America Americans were doing before the age of modern medicine. The differences are pretty shocking, so stay tuned till the end. So why is this surgery even done in the first place? Well, obviously, because it's fun! Who doesn't want to crack open a skull every now and then? Anyway, the actual main reasons listed by Dr. Furnas and his team include acute cranial trauma, or in layman's terms, a head injury, and post-traumatic headache. On top of that, it's worth noting that according to an old documentary that can be found on the Kenya Digital Archives, the surgery was also conducted to deal with brain cancer. That documentary, by the way, is very bloody and gory. It's a very hard thing to watch. Luckily for you, I watched it so you didn't have to. I'll be sparing you from all that gruesomeness because I know plenty of people watch YouTube on their lunch break, so don't worry about all that. Plus, I have more up-to-date information to share with you all that isn't covered in that old documentary. That said, for those of you who have the stomach for it, I will go ahead and share the link for that old documentary later on in the video. So this old-fashioned brain surgery is referred to by two names, trepanation and the more modern name of craniotomy. According to this quote from science.org, trepanation likely started as a treatment for head wounds, says David Kushner, a neurologist at the University of Miami in Florida. After a traumatic injury, such surgery would have cleaned up skull fractures and relieved pressure on the brain, which commonly swells and accumulates fluid after a blow to the head. So let's get into how the Kisi do their craniotomies. Methods can vary between different omobaris. Unlike some traditional healers, the omobari do not claim to have any supernatural healing powers, but instead are simply confident in the skills passed down to them by their ancestors. And although some do take part in a short prayer before their work begins, 
No ritual is required before the operation commences, and in fact, some Omabaris see prayer as completely unnecessary. Various herbs and medicines are prepared in preparation for the operation, ranging from vital herbs such as ground-up leaves that are packed into the open-up head in order to stop the flow of blood, to things as simple as leaves that cover the scent of blood during the operation. And there are more medicines as well, but we don't have time to get into it all. Like the herbs, the tools can also vary. They can include things like knives, picks, chisels, scrapers, and etc. One Omobari reportedly even used a hacksaw. In preparation for the craniotomy, the patient skips dinner. Their head was often shaved bald and then washed with soap and water. The surgical tools are put into a container with boiling water to sanitize them. The surgeon then washes his hands. To commence the operation, he begins to palpate the head in order to access the point of injury and to decide where to make the incision. The family of the patient are present to both restrain and support them. The family members need to hold down the patient because they are kept conscious during the process. Though many modern surgeries are done with the patient being unconscious, keeping a patient awake during surgery can be very beneficial, and in fact some modern brain surgeons do as the Omabari do in order to have live feedback from the client so that if the doctor has messed up in some way, they can know immediately from the patient's reactions. Once everyone is ready, a cut of about 10 centimeters is made into the scalp. Assistants then hold the wound's edges apart with retractors, and as stated earlier, crushed leaves are put under the cut edges of the scalp to prevent blood flow. Any parts of the bone that were cracked during the patient's head injury are removed, and then the surrounding bone is smoothed out. The omabari begins to scrape the skull with rhythmic motions. The area is gradually beveled inward so that the diameter of the defect is diminished as it progresses deeper. Every now and then, the wound would be sponged with either leaves or foam sponges. As the omabari gets deeper, he switches to finer, more delicate tools. When the skull shows signs of flexibility, he switches to a pick. With careful outward flicks of his pick, he removes the last layer of skull and exposes the brain. This hole in the skull provides drainage of blood from an intracranial hematoma caused when the patient initially injured their head. The wound is then rinsed with clear water. Afterward, a coating of mineral oil is applied and then either clarified butter or animal fat was placed on top of the wound. And as strange as this may seem, said wounds are mostly unsutured and left open. Part of the success of the operation is not only the Omabari's exceptional hand-eye coordination, but also the post-operative care which can last a long time. During this time, the traditional doctor makes many follow-up visits to do things like repack the wounds with herbs and change the head dressing. In two papers I read, questions were raised as to how the Kisi came to learn of the practice of craniotomies. One consideration was the possibility that the knowledge of this operation came from ancient Egypt, but both papers admit that this kind of surgery was very rare in Egypt. The other possibility was an introduction of the practice from the Arab world, which is proposed by the paper The History of Trepanation in Africa with a discussion of its current status and continuing practice. By Drs. Charles E. Rawlings III and Eugene Rostich. However, this same paper notes that trepanation of the skull has been reported as far south as the Zulu and as far west as Peru in South America. Considering all that, I believe it's best to assume that Dr. Fernes and his team's conclusion is the most likely answer, which is that the Kisi developed the techniques of craniotomies on their own through many generations of trial and error. Before we move on, I just want to note that the point of this video is not to say that if you have a headache, you should book a flight to a village in Kenya and seek treatment from an Omabari. I am a firm believer in modern medicine, and I don't like the general movement in America that is trying to sow doubt in academics, scientists, and doctors. After all, I wouldn't even be able to make this video if these college-educated doctors like Dr. Furness had not written these research papers. There are two basic points to this video. One is simply that I think it's 
it's both fascinating and impressive that these people were able to do this operation back in the olden days, and I wanted to share this info with all of you. And the second point of the video has to do with the comparison that I'll be doing at the end of the video, which we'll be getting to pretty soon. Modern Kisi populations have differing opinions about their people's traditional brain surgeons. Some Kisi see the practice as an outdated embarrassment, while many other Kisi take pride in their people's traditional skills and knowledge to successfully carry out such an intense procedure with very little complications. Now having said all that, you might be wondering about the safety and risk of these old-fashioned forms of brain surgery. It's certainly a valid concern, but before I give you the mortality rate for this Kenyan surgery, I got a little fun fact for you about America. In the American Civil War, around 200 instances of brain surgery known as trepanation was performed on soldiers with a staggering 57% mortality rate. Meanwhile, according to Dr. Furness and his team's research, the Omabaris of Kenya have a low mortality and a high satisfaction rate among their clients. Their research paper does not specifically state what the mortality rate for the Kisi patients are, but according to that old documentary I mentioned earlier in the video, 96% of patients survive the surgery. That means the mortality rate is a mere 4%. As impressive as that is, it's possible that this survival statistic may be even better than 4%. Now, although the paper does not outright say what the mortality rate is, luckily it gives us enough data that we can do the math ourselves. The paper records that in 1957, a former Kesey District Medical Officer estimated approximately 500 head operations were performed Yearly. This same officer pointed out that only six deaths were reported in the last two years. So we can use those numbers to figure out the mortality rate of Kesey craniotomies. If there was six deaths in two years, then that's three fatalities per year. Then we divide the three by the number of operations, 500, and that gives us 0 0.006, which we then multiply by 100 for our answer. And that answer is that the mortality rate is 0.6%. In other words, less than 1% of people treated by Omabari die. But we can dig even farther, though, because the doctors who wrote this paper have their own numbers to share. The estimate these doctors came to is that about 500 to 800 procedures are conducted by the Kisi Omabari per year. And during their study, their group of researchers identified three fatal complications. Therefore, the math we'll do this time is 3 divided by 800, which gives us 0 0.00375. We then multiply that by 100, which gives us a mortality rate of 0 0.375. Even if we assume there were some fatalities during a year that were not reported on, and for argument's sake just assume that there was twice as many or maybe even triple as many deaths a year, that would still leave you with a very low percentage. Now, as I stated earlier, more than half of the brain surgeries carried out in the American Civil War led to patients dying. So at a time when racist white Americans were arguing that black folks were inferior to white people, their white doctors were failing miserably at their jobs. Meanwhile, black African doctors in Kenya were able to keep vastly more of their patients alive. Isn't that interesting? Happy Black History Month, everyone, and please remember to watch the other videos in the Untold Black History 2 playlist, which will be linked both on screen and in the description of this video. Thanks for watching.